Thank you all for coming. It's always nice to see a relatively full room. I'm sure you're here for both the wonderful information you're going to get about China and whatever other carrot they have provided you to be present in the room. So let's start there. Why did you wander into this lecture hall today to hear about China? Why are you here? I'll just start pointing at people. It's super fun. Anybody? Why are you here? Why'd you turn up? I visited China years ago. Okay, where'd you go in China? Bojo? Okay. So you're here because you've been there and you're interested. Other, other folks? Huh, you. <laughs> Why are you here? Do you actually think that China is one of the countries right now that actually has a lot of controversy? I mean, so what is the kind of question that's what I'm trying to ask? What kind of capitalist country is China? Is communist? Or what is exactly your political sphere that is surrounding China? I think that is the question of all. So, so what is China? How does it relate? Guatemala is a unique place in the world, given it does not have formal relations with China in a diplomatic sense, but those things may be changing under the new political regime that's entering office. Those things are in flux. It turns out China is an interesting question for virtually every country and every person in the world because of both the scope of its economic influence and the fact that it operates somewhat differently than Western-style liberal democracies that we might traditionally think about. And so part of what interested Ethan and I, and I should say Ethan Yang is a co-author of mine. Uh, he was a former student of mine that worked at AIER with me uh, on a part-time basis, finishing up his third year in US law school. He's going to go be a lawyer and ruin the world. I tried to talk him out of it. It didn't work. But he was interested in China. And I spent a bunch of time working with Ethan over the last about three years, where Ethan would write lots of little pieces about China. And then I would yell at him and tell him he hadn't thought about it well enough, that he needed to do more research. And then finally, my response was, you have to go, actually, we're going to write a book on this, and we're going to learn this material together. Because it turns out, I wasn't an expert on China when I walked into this process. Instead, I was a public choice economist who had a set of tools and said, these are tools we can use to do lots of analysis, including analysis about China. And in the end, we wrote this, we ended up having this book together that just that came out recently. And so the title of the book is The China Dilemma, Rethinking US. China relations through public choice theory. How many of you have ever taken an international relations class? See, if I was over talking to Santi's group in, the, in EPRI, they'd all have said yes. And I spent a bunch of time last fall talking to those students saying, everything you have learned in international relations is wrong. You should use public choice economics to understand this. It was a big hit. Now, lots of international relations scholars don't love it. But our point is, we're going to try to understand how countries could deal with China and what that means for the larger. The other reason I got interested was not just because Ethan was annoying me, but it's because, like you, I spent about a decade teaching in China off and on in short-term visits. And part of what I saw there was an interesting puzzle and conundrum. China was simultaneously the most capitalistic market-based place in the world, in the ground and on the markets, in the little shops. and run by a communist leadership that wanted to centrally plan the economy. How on earth do those two things exist together? Well, it turns out many of those explanations can be found in applying public choice. How many of you have taken a class or know what public choice is? What's public choice? It's the use of economic tools for, polit for politics. It's, the it's taking the tools of the economist the assumptions the economist makes about rationality, about what people seek to do, and applying them to political questions. Questions that exist in the non-state arena, which is what James Buchanan called it. James Buchanan was one of the early founders of the public choice school. And his point was that much of what we do in our daily lives are not merely, they're not merely market transactions, meaning it's not just the buying and selling of goods. But much of what we do exists in this other part, the non-market world, 
But that world doesn't, doesn't exist outside of the assumptions of economics. That instead, economics, the principles, the foundations, and our understanding of how individuals behave, relate, and what the, how they achieve their desires is far more universal than just in the marketplace of buying and selling. And public choice says, if we start with the assumptions that individuals are rational, meaning that they know what they want, and they will take action to achieve the things they want, and that they will generally attempt to maximize what they want, not every time, but generally, then we can begin to predict their behavior, and that remains true whether it's somebody buying and selling a good or service, or Xi Jinping trying to run China. And so what we've done is tried to take those tools, the tools of the economist, and begin to explore what we call the China dilemma. Because for most, most discussions of how to interact with China, there's a different set of tools that are used, called international relations, that assume the state, the country, is the core unit of analysis. And in economics, who do we assume is the core unit of analysis? The individual. And so we start with that same belief as we begin. So I should say I'm from the American Institute for Economic Research. Um, it's a group in the United States that's focused on studying the principles of economics as well as their application to policy. I work with a wonderful group of scholars there who are dedicated to trying to understand a variety of things. We'll talk a little more at the end about some of the opportunities that you all could have to do things with us. But they're what really make it possible for me to do things like spend a year writing a book with Ethan, having the resources to be able to, to enjoy um, working on collaborative projects with UFM, and so we should acknowledge them as part of this. But let's start here. So what do you see? Describe what's up on the screen. Buildings. What does it look like? It's colorful, right? Highly developed. We'd, if we were looking at this and thinking about development, yeah, we'd call that highly developed. This is a picture from China. It's on one of my trips. I took it. Uh, this was actually out in western China in a, in a place that uh, is not among the most developed. But if you go to China, this is a, you'll see this in virtually every major city, relatively high levels of development. It looks a lot like a western city, right? This could be in any, any sort of major city in the United States or in Europe or parts of Latin America. But we see this having happened in China. Okay? We also see this. So what do we see here? Okay, we see housing. Other than this right here in the center. This view could be really of anywhere in the world. Perhaps some of the little details will be different. This pagoda and this giant one, different sort of architectures, but it looks very familiar and very similar, right? These are not, this doesn't, you don't look at this and say, oh my God, this must be China, with this one exception here in the center, okay? And so this was taken looking out of my hotel room um, at one of the universities. This is uh, another mid-major city. This is actually in Beijing. And so when we think about China, we want to have this perspective in mind. You visited Guangzhou. What was it like? It was so very well there, there was a bunch of, of buildings, but it was mostly Okay, lots of unoccupied buildings. So you had, you had lots of investment in capital, not a lot of folks living there. Okay, anybody else been to China? Yeah, where'd you go? Uh, to the same city. Okay, what was it like? I think it was totally rich and like I expected, well, the first thing we we did was trying like to access social media and all that stuff. Yeah, that was going to happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, and after, well, that, that you know, this, the, the initial stress of not knowing how to work that out and everything, uh, we really enjoyed the trip. Okay. I, I think it's like, besides, you know, like knowing and like 
people actually look different. Uh, there's nothing that you should that you separated from knowing. Like if you are not, if you're not in the picture of everything that's happening, you think it's a, an all right thing. If you're, an, if you're an alien that just looks down and just observes the cities, you're going to see some wideness, right? You're going to see cities like I've shown you. You'll see some poverty. You'll see rural areas. All that's going to be the case. China's not a unicorn that looks just entirely different. So when we start at these things, the look, we, can, we see lots of similarities. The differences start to emerge somewhat under the surface. Forty years ago, if I was up giving this presentation, we'd have talked about an underdeveloped China, right? We would have had really three major cities that had significant development that had gone on in them, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. And then you'd have had the rest of China that was primarily still um, in relatively small communities, although there, there were large conglomerations of people, but there was not lots of interconnection. Today, mid-sized cities in China will routinely top two or three million residents with lots of development. The growth has been enormous over the last 50 year, 40 to 50 years. But as we look at it, it looks very familiar. But we start to get a sense that something's different when you end up on the ground. You guys have brought up the social media. Absolutely. So in order to communicate in China, how do you do it? WeChat. WeChat, right? How many of you have a WeChat? A couple? Okay, I have a WeChat. I work with a lot of Chinese academics, uh, although they probably shouldn't talk to me anymore after I publish the book, because um, I'll be a problem for them. But there's a whole different set of things that get developed. And so we're going to talk about what leads to China. This last picture looks totally different, right? What's going on here? It's a food spot, right? Okay, so this was a, a couple. I, this was in Lanzhou, out in western China, in one of the markets. This is these are these are the these are the sorts of people that make me say China is one of the most intensely capitalistic places I have ever been. They've been running this food stall for about 30 years in the market in Lanzhou. Um, they were really irritated with me because I kept trying to talk to them while they were attempting to sell food. Right, you can picture this, right? I'm the alien that showed up and wants to hear all about their business and why they do this and how it works and that. And they're like, come on. We're trying to sell a bunch of, of egg omelets, essentially, is what they're mostly selling. And you're here bugging us. But they've been doing business like this, like I said, for about 40 years. They finally would talk to me, but they told me I had to come back the next morning before anybody else got there. And as I talked to them, what I discovered was, my, what my suspicion was, was correct. Was their motivations look like it, most everyone else's? Why do they run this business stall? For money. Why do, why do they want money? They just want money for money's sake? Is it just to survive? To satisfy their needs? They had a series of aims and goals, and they were taking action to attempt to achieve them. It was to raise a family. They, had, they actually had three boys. They were from uh, one of the minority communities, so they were allowed more than one children in the era they were having them. And they were attempting to raise a family. They were interested in those sort of things, and it's what motivated them. Turns out those things are universal. And as we start to understand the universality of the assumptions, we can start then to ask some harder questions. Because China's not just those guys, right? It's also this guy. Who's this? It's, it's President Xi of China. And President Xi of China, as over here said, he wants to be Mao Zedong. President Xi is the leader of the CCP. Okay? One of the things that's important to note about China is they have a very particular political structure. We call it what? So totalitarian would be one of the classifications. We actually have a very specific name for it that we can steal from political scientists, which is it is a Leninist communist regime. Okay? Anybody know what that means? Okay, what's communism? So let's back up for a second, because this becomes really important to understand the motivation. Because in communism, you have state ownership of the means of production. Okay? 
Rather than private ownership, capital is held primarily by the state, and the state directs. This in China looks like state-owned enterprises. And in the early days of China under Mao Zedong, it also included land collectivization and farming. It included industrial collectivization. It included natural resource confiscation. And it also included actual fit private property confiscation as well, all to be held in common by the state. Now, robust doctrinaire communists would say it doesn't have to be the state, it's just communal held. We have no examples of communism where communal held does not mean the state. Zero. Okay, so that's the first part. It's how capital and how ownership occurs. And the second part was Leninism. Anybody know what a Leninist system looks like? What was the other big Leninist system in the day? Soviet Union. And that's how it's organized. Okay? It's how the politics of the communist regime is organized. It's organized through a series of committees led by a central committee known as the Politburo that has all decision-making rights for both economic matters and political matters. And they're unified under Leninism. Mao will introduce a few changes to Leninism and call this essentially Leninism with with Chinese characteristics. They'll sometimes call it Marxism with Chinese characteristics or communism with Chinese characteristics, but it's led through a series of committees. The Communist Party is the ruling party in China. There are no alternative parties. They are who organize the Politburo and the subcommittees across the country. Okay? They then, from the party, select the ministers of government. Okay, so think about how that's organized, right? So there are not, there's, there are not elections, there are not, there's not a totalitarian dictator as we traditionally think about it. It's organized in this Leninist diffusion of committees that then hierarchically roll up to the Politburo. Okay? That structure is going to matter in a second because it turns out how many of you think that he can do just whatever he wants? Anybody believe that? Why? Because he's the ruler of China. He's the ruler of China. Okay. So he wants to be Mao. Mao did rule in much the same, in much that way. That's true. But it turns out even Mao was part of that committee. Mao's, Mao's title was head of the CCP. He also chaired the Politburo, and he was the premier in the beginning. Okay? These were all unified roles that came together, but they were tied to the party. And in order to understand the actions of Xi, we have to understand his role not just as the leader of China, but as a part of the Communist Party of China, meaning that his selection and rise to power didn't occur through violence. It didn't occur through election. It occurred through some other mechanism whereby he had to be selected by the small group of the Communist Party. And it's estimated there are between two and five million members of the Communist Party in China in a country that's over a billion people. It's a very small subset that makes the decisions. Okay? And she emerges from that. She spent a long career moving up the ranks from local to provincial, eventually into the central government, to become the head of the CCP and the head of China today. Okay. So what, does, what motivates someone like Xi? Power, okay. power to do what? Whatever he pleases. Okay. Does Xi do whatever he pleases? Well, we're going to look at that because it turns out she lives in a world where he still has to take action to achieve his preferences. It's not as though his word is simply enough. Okay? And he's going to try to take those actions, but there are mitigating institutions, just like there is in a marketplace, that you have to work through in order to achieve the preference. Is simply saying, I want X, enough in the market to get X? 
No, what, hap what has to happen? Exchange through an institution, typically, the institution we call the market, has to occur. She faces the same thing. There is a set of institutions that will have to be used, and we're going to talk about them in some detail. So, some ways in which we think about China. So, the United States has a serious problem in trying to figure out what its position is going to be towards China. Because we know some things about China that are disturbing, right? There we know there are a few free speech rights. We know there is abuse of minority groups in China, limitations on the use of capital. What happens if you're a billionaire in China running Alibaba and, you just, and you, the CCP decides you're a problem? You disappear, right? Bad things could happen. If you're the vice president of Evergrande, the electric car division, and they decide you're a problem, what happens? He also disappeared for a while and was removed from power at Evergrande. And, they, and the Chinese state took that part of Evergrande and nationalized it, essentially. Okay? There's major issues in China. China's not a liberal democratic regime. It has, not, it has very low levels of personal freedom, relatively low levels of economic freedom, especially at the macro level. And so understanding it is problematic. And in the United States, we've had an active discussion for at least the last 25 years about what our policy should be towards China. And we're going to use that lens of how the US thinks about China to really explore what she is and how China operates. Because in doing so, we can start to see where some of the errors will populate. So in the United States, Ethan really likes to go to these events in Washington, D.C. He seems to love them for some reason. I last about two minutes and then want to tell every elected official in the room, you are an idiot and you are too stupid. You should resign and go away. That does not make me a lot of friends in Washington, D.C., so I don't go to them anymore. But Ethan goes, and he was at uh, an invitation event where a U.S. politician, a U.S. senator, was talking specifically about China and said the following. Western businesses and financiers are selling the Chinese Communist Party the rope it will use to hang the United States. By working with them economically, we're giving them the power to destroy the US, is essentially what he said. This is a typical political response to China. Okay? It assumes some things about China as well, right? What's the big assumption it makes about China? that they want to hang the United States, right? That's the first assumption. It also assumes that by doing this, that means will work. So there's a big assumption there. And it's that assumption at the end I really want us to focus on. That the goal in most of our political discussions about China in the US, and especially recently, has been that it's going to try, it's trying to destroy the United States or the Western liberal democracies. It's these guys. These are three U.S. politicians. Eh, three of my least favorite U.S. politicians are up on the screen on this subject. But they're the ones that are, are, are actively arguing for this in U.S. policy. At the same time, academics have had approaches to trying to answer this question of how do you inter interact with a place like China. And international relations says, well, it's not really about she and the, and the individuals. It's about the states. It's about the United States versus China in some sort of grand competition. Okay? In fact, they call it grand competition theory, as the way they talk about it. And it emphasizes foreign policy, the interaction between the two states over things happening internally as what's going to drive the behavior of the two states. They view countries as rational actors rather than individuals. But often we talk about this as though there are. And in doing so, we forget all the lessons that economics can bring to the table about what motivates people within the system. Because you're all about to have a, a new president in Guatemala, right? Did the interests of Guatemala change because he's going to change a bunch of policy? No, right? The key here is now someone else is in power and what matters to that person is going to influence how Guatemala interacts with the rest of the world. 
most of international relations says, doesn't matter who's elected president here or there. Doesn't matter that it's she versus his predecessor. It's China versus the United States. And those interests are competitive. Our approach is something entirely different. As I said at the beginning, we take political economy and say, states aren't real things. They're collections of institutions and people. And if you want to understand what a state is going to do, you have to understand the people in power and the institutions that leave them in power across time. Okay? In particular, we're interested in the incentive structures that drive political decision making, whether that be constitutional frameworks, electoral pressures, or the Leninist regimes of the Politburo. Those are all institutions, sets of rules that are going to matter. And that understanding those rules and the people that live within them will get us farther down the path of understanding a place like China than simply saying, China is this or China is that. If you travel very much across China, you find a fairly diverse place, a place that looks like the pictures I showed you and some grinding poverty. Okay? Get out into the countryside, especially in Western China or Central China, and you'll find poverty at the less than one US dollar per day level. Most of China's come up from that, but it's still there inside China. And so our approach takes this and says, all the things economics has taught us are still true when we enter the political arena. And so when we start this, taking public choice and adding it to our study, especially of US-China relations, lets us reveal the incentives and pressures that underpin the CCP's sometimes seemingly bizarre and draconian policies. So why does the CCP, for example, shut off social media in China? Why no social media in China? To have more control over the, the people, the individuals, the mass. Okay, to have more control, that's true, but why do they want the control? Let's take this back to actually understanding the motivation. Do they just want control for control's sake? What, are, what is their primary interest? To keep ruling. What are the potential risks to continuing to rule in China? I think if uh, people have access to different media from outside, or even if they can communicate better like without uh, the government spying on them, they can you know, get ideas and like, realize that it's not that great. Okay, so it might be that it will, re it will raise a recognition that there's a better alternative, right? Things are richer. This is the great story when uh, Gorbachev comes to the United States in the late 1980s and is taken to a supermarket in, in the American South. He's utterly surprised by the abundance at a sort of standard U.S. grocery store. Believes that it's been staged in part. In part. Okay, so it's that. It's also social media in particular. Turns out movements start on social media. How many of you have heard of the Arab Spring? Okay, what was the Arab Spring? It was the attempt to uh, get rid of the theocracies governing the Arabs. Yeah, it was an attempt to change governments in the Arab countries, mostly they were theocracies. It was organized almost exclusively through what we would call social media platform or peer-to-peer -peer communication. They want to crush the ability to organize direct opposition to the CCP. Okay? This is what public choice lets us do. It says, we, if we understand the incentives, we can start to explain the behavior. Because it's too simple to simply say the CCP is bad and evil. US politicians know how to say that. And they, and they are. I'll just say they are. But it's another to say what's motivating them to take the action. Turns out you can identify this in almost every instance. And as we start to understand that, we can start to potentially talk about what could be done to change the calculation for that behavior. And that's really what public choice brings to this, is a recognition that the incentives are partly what drive behavior. And for folks that are in power, it's to stay in power. So our friend Xi here, What's his incentives? What does she want? 
He wants to continue to rule, right? So what does she have to do? You're going to have to keep the party happy, right? Because who can remove you from power? The other members of the Politburo, okay? What else has to happen? Is there, are they your only risk? What? You have to keep the people in check, and you have, lot, you have a few different ways to do that, right? You have a carrot by economic growth, which is the main way China has gotten compliance. Okay, one of the things that's clearly evident is that if you, when you look at the best surveys, and they're not good, of the Chinese public, they express relative satisfaction because of the growth in income across time. CCP has used that to stay in power over the last 40 years. They have, a, they have some trouble. Is the Chinese economy doing great right now? No, it's a, bit of, it's a mess. And so they had to pivot to something else, and they pivoted to nationalism, telling the story of China and how great it is to be Chinese, the importance of the Chinese nation in the world. All these are the motivations that drive. Yeah. There's also the avoidance of a new humiliation of China. Yeah. There's a history of empire. There, there is a history of regional empire, for sure. And they, so if you listen to the CCP talk in particular, um, they talk about the century of humiliation. That's that period from the fall, from, it's the period when Western powers divided up Shanghai. So the reason why we love to visit Shanghai is because, because of its different sectors, right? It has beautiful architecture that came out of a period in which you had Western occupiers controlling that part of China, and they call it the century of humiliation. Mao coins this term. They're gonna emerge from that century of humiliation when Mao seizes control, okay? And they're going to reassert themselves on the world stage. So they want to avoid that, right? They, need, they use that as a, as a mechanism. On top of that, when you no longer have economic growth, what, hap what could happen? So economic growth ceases to occur. Social, social unrest. And so, say that louder. Dissatisfaction. So at the same time, the Chinese economy starts to stall, what does China start to do with regard to the giant companies in China? Happens at the same time. They start to take them apart and blame them for the lack of growth. If you listen to the discussions about Alibaba and Evergrande and these ghost cities that you're referencing, the, the enforcement goes way up at the same time growth is dropping to try to change the narrative. It's standard people taking action to try to achieve their interest. Lots of you probably thought economics had nothing to do with politics, right? How many of you think that or thought that before you walked in here? Hopefully you don't believe that if you're at UFM, but that's the assumption many, many students of economics have. They see, they see economics as the marketplace, political science as politics, and we divide the two. But the same tools we use to understand people's behavior in the marketplace are pretty universal. They let us explain this guy's actions. They let us explain the couple in the market. They let me explain my behavior. All that is what's driving people's influences. And people can have a myriad of desires, but they're going to take actions to achieve them. And it's at that core we find economics throughout all of it because it's that same set of core assumptions, the importance of the individual, economic rationality, and the desire to achieve ends that motivates most of human behavior. And that's true whether it's China or Guatemala or the United States, and whether we're talking about how leaders of countries act or the entrepreneur in the marketplace. Those truths remain the same. So one of the interesting things about China, so there's this graph. If you look at this graph, one of the things we've, know, we've noted is that China has been on this huge growth up rate, right? This is real GDP per capita inflation adjusted. And if you look at this, look at what's happened. From 1952 to 2012, they've gone from about 235 all the way up to 1280 average GDP per capita. But one of the more interesting part of the story is these bumps in the road. And then if you actually extend this data, you have a drop here 
when you, when you add the next five years. And those correlate with the actions of the Chinese state. So in the beginning, you had some liberalization because they had no control. Mao could not control the countryside, so people were active. He implements one of his draconian policies and control and collectivization, and what happens? They drop. They make some changes to it. You see some, a little bit of liberalization, and then he institutes the Great Leap Forward, and it drops again. Mao dies in 78, okay? There are some, there's a little bit of change that happens here, and then Mao dies in 78, and a major thing changes. Deng comes to power, and Deng decides to liberalize the marketplace essentially at anything other than the state level. So there are still going to be state-owned enterprises and coordination, but individuals will be allowed to own businesses and to operate them as they see fit. And we begin to open, and you see this dramatic growth from his death until the 1990s. Okay, and then what happens in the 1990s? U.S.-China relations again change with even more opening, and the Shang, things like the Shanghai stock market reopens, and you see dramatic growth through market liberalization, changing the incentives of individuals, and then you have it even continue. What you start to see when you get up here is a flattening and then a decline. And it happens because, again, they change the incentives. It's harder to grow when you're rich, percentage-wise. And so what do they do? Xi tries to consolidate his own power because he's concerned that business owners are, can challenge his, his ruling. And as a result, you see a drop in real G, you actually see a drop in real GDP per capita. Not a huge one, but it drops. And the growth rate plummets. And so part of what we, we see here is that those institutions and the incentives that people face are a lot of what drive it. And, it and as a result, why didn't any of the rulers between Deng and Xi change this liberalization? Well, it's because the growth of the market could keep them in power. No one was seriously challenging the CCP through that entire period because of the growth they were delivering. Now you see much more dissent. In 1989, you have this little flattened period here. This is the end of the Soviet Union. It's Tiananmen Square. It's a little bit of social unrest because world dynamics change. But they reopen even further, and they use, they use growth to be able to maintain power. That's going to get tougher across time for China. All right, somebody over here had a question. Yeah. Uh, I'll go by a question about the mega projects in China. Sure. Just in general, like they're mainly ghost towns, and why do they do that? Okay, so a couple of things about that. One is we have we have lots of examples of ghost towns. That is certainly true. I think there's a misnomer in some of the Western media that most of them are ghost towns. Um, we've seen a few examples of it, and they typically become ghost towns for three reasons. One is overcapitalization at the requirement of the Chinese state. So the Chinese state required Evergrande to have shovel-ready projects that they were building in order to continue to operate. So what does that do? That gives them the incentive to build lots and lots of open space. Okay, so that's the first. The second is social planning. They have them build them where they want the city to go, not where people want to live. Classic error of government. You decide, you, if you, it's, in the United States, we would call it the field of dreams approach, which is a movie about that if you build the baseball diamond, everybody will come and play baseball. Same basic approach. You build it here, of course everyone will move here. Sometimes it works, often it doesn't. And then the third is, that you had uh, speculation within China in a desire to build internal capital markets so that uh, there, was, there was a push and a change in the tax status treatment of capital investment that gave preference to, to capital being used inside China as opposed to capital being invested outside to China, which caused a huge capital flow in that worked with the other two things to create huge ghost towns. So at its core, this is all government activity pushing it. 
Not the only reason. Sometimes they just want to build them, but those are three of the major reasons that affect. Others? Why don't you expect uh, the gain from Germany to welcome your choice and have this research for China measures, which is, I know, for example, Trump, you know, the American American and the, all the elements of the balance of payments, issues, and whatnot, which is that yeah. economic uh, component. So, so what, so what I, th I think the primary addition that it does is it actually gives meat on the bone to do, an ana to do analysis and actually think about the policy response. Right now, most of US policy towards China is ideologically driven as opposed to driven by any sort of actual analysis of the effect. And so it starts with the assumption that China is X, not with an understanding of why China is doing X. And if we understand the root, then our behavior can respond accordingly. The classic example is how many of you believe China will attack Taiwan? Anybody believe that? Attack Taiwan. Very commonly held belief, especially among the international relations world, um, although not universal. Um, and there's this belief, and if you poll, there's a belief that it will happen. Okay. Our US policy is premised on the notion that China at some point is going to attack Taiwan. Okay, why doesn't why hasn't China attacked Taiwan? Taiwan is really useful to the CCP for talking about how they're going to take back China. They're going to take back Taiwan. So actually trying to move on Taiwan has th at least three scenarios. The first is they could try and do it and win, and then they lose the ability to talk about how this still remains undone, we need it back. That's the best case scenario. Okay. Second scenario, they try and they fail. What does that do to the CCP? She decides to try to take Taiwan and Taiwan manages to repel the Chinese, the mainland army and navy. The, he'll be gone, he will not be in power. Third scenario, it gives them the benefit of being able to talk about wanting to take, take Taiwan, posture with the West, Okay? And it leaves Xi in power. Taiwan actually wouldn't be easy to take. It's been referred to by military analysts as, a, as essentially an island um, aircraft carrier. Heavily armored, very difficult. It's also highly likely that other nations will get involved in a dispute over Taiwan. I don't think the US intervenes, incidentally, but certainly Australia, Japan, would have high interest in the region and possibly Korea. If Korea and Japan enter, that could pull the US in. So it's huge risk for, for limited reward when talking about Taiwan and one China is all upside. They caught Hong Kong by the tail. Hong Kong's become a huge problem for Xi. They took it over implemented a bunch of rule there, and then what happened to the Hong Kong capital markets? Are they as attractive? No, they now behave like the Beijing and the Shanghai capital markets with a few distinctions, but it's caused some trouble for Xi, and he's ended up having to deal with Hong Kong far more now than he did when they were under separate rule. Now, there are other things that made him, so he's gonna have to because there were organized anti-China movements in Hong Kong. So the calculation he made was staying in power. Okay, other questions? Yeah. The economic and political institutions, because I can see um, like the people in the market in the food spot, they drive themselves almost entirely by, by economic institutions, but I see um, she just doing what, what he has in its own interest to do, I mean, driving itself more by pulling those dishes, but and um, it's like the same, the same kind of money. But when you like go down, maybe from shade to, mm -hmm. to a pilot, and maybe you end up in a, in a very low political sphere, sure. right? you go upside from the from the food spot, you might end up in the CEOs of, of the big enterprises in China. Yeah, like there you would have. A little bit of a problem because 
there are a lot, like the case you were talking about, Evergrande, where <coughs> the Chinese government actually nationalizes part of it. Oh. So when you take that into account, we would say, well, China kind of hinders its own growth because they nationalize a big part. So that wouldn't that be like contradictory? Like to say she likes economic growth or in the face in power, but actually he tries to hinder it for economic growth to be not so high. Yeah, it turns out people have a multitude of preferences. And we're trying to we're trying to achieve all of them simultaneously. And it turns out, in doing that, there's this handy economic conception known as trade-offs that we have to make every single time. So yes, she, she could stay in power with lots of economic growth. There's a problem that comes as places get really rich, what happens? It's, called, it's essentially, it's a Kuznet-style curve. You get super rich, what happens? Okay, you'll stop growing, but even more than that, less competitive, and suddenly you really start to care about a set of other things other than the growth in your income. Turns out income is not a, a, a grid that just keeps every marginal dollar isn't worth the same. Okay, So then you start to focus on other things. So places that are, as wealth increases, what starts to happen? Well, we start to see pushes for other things. So she's balancing these things out. Because growth will get tougher, but it's also, as you get wealthy, you start to have other demands. A place that's done an interesting job of managing that is Singapore. Singapore is still a totalitarian regime, very wealthy, very low political freedoms. But if you watch, you can see slight policy changes that respond as they get wealthier to what's allowable, greater travel rights, those sorts of things happen in Singapore to try to adjust against them as you have increased demands for things other than just dollars. And with that, thank you all very much for letting me uh, spend an hour or so with you talking about China. And uh, as always, it's a delightful time here at UFM. Thanks.